Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the work session for the Bladensburg Town Council. Today is Monday, September 14th. We appreciate everyone joining by watching us from home, given that our town hall facilities are still closed to the public, out of safety for our residents and our staff, given that we're still in the um, COVID-19 pandemic. At this time, we'll call tonight's meeting to order. And uh, if I may, I just want to ask for a moment of silence, if we could. As you all know, last Friday, our nation observed the 19th anniversary of September 11th. And I think it's worthy that we just take a moment of silence to reflect on the lives that were lost, as well as the first responders who did an amazing job helping all of the victims and who are still dealing with the loss of their loved ones as well. So if we could just have a pause for a moment of silence. Thank you so much. At this time, the item on the agenda we'll turn our attention to is the approval of work session minutes. Um, we've been asked to table the June minutes to October, but would like to ask for an, a motion to approve the July work session minutes. I so move. Moved by Council Member Rout. Is there a second? Okay. Seconded by Council Member Blunt. All in favor, let it be known by the saying of aye. Aye. Any nays? The ayes have it, thank you so much. At this time, we are um, fortunate to have Mr. Sam White with us from the Prince George's County Planning Department. And at this time, he will come and give the council a presentation on the Annapolis Road feasibility study and also give us an update on how the project is going. So welcome, Mr. White. Greetings, Council Members, Pretty. Mayor James. My name is Samuel again. My name is Samuel White. I'm a senior planner with the Prince George's County Planning Department, Community Planning Division. I am also the ma project manager for the market feasibility and economic analysis study for the town of Bladesburg. Tonight, I'm going to give you a brief update of where we are with the project. As you know, the town of Bladesburg received funding from our planning assistance to municipalities program to conduct a study that will inform the revitalization efforts to implement the um, Bladesburg Town Center character area recommendation for the 20, the 2009 Ports Town Sector Plan, which recommends mixed use development. The study area consists of 17 acres and it also includes commercial and industrial land uses along the Annapolis Road corridor from the bridge from Kenilworth Avenue all the way up to 51st Street. Are you familiar with that area? And I also gave everybody a map for the area. To date, in, in, in June, the consultant, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. it's a little closer to you. Okay, yeah, because I got this yeah. mask on. <laughs> Sorry about the math. I can fit this right here. The consultant <laughs> that received the, uh, the study proceed, I mean, had a notice to proceed in June of, I think it was June 19th. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's better. I feel like I'm, I'm like, <laughs> okay, our consultant firm receive a notice to proceed to start the study in June. In July, the consultant conducted interviews to gather background information on the project. In August, we did a walking tour of the study area. We also did a, a walking tour of the Bladensburg waterfront and also the Boswick House. Even though the Boswick House was a historic house and the Blainsburg Waterfall is not included in the study, it still would inform the economic analysis part of the study. Next steps will be, oh, also during, after the tour, well, I should say during the tour, the town representative gave us the vision of the, of the study and what they want to see in the area. That was given to the planning department and also to the uh, consultant. Uh, and it's a workshop tentatively scheduled 
for December to present preliminary finding to key stakeholders. And right now, that's where we are as far as the study is concerned. And you have to excuse me, I'm trying to get used to talking with this mic. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Oh, and it's also the study should be completed in the summer of 2021, tentatively. Summer of 2021. 2021. Okay. Are there any questions from the council for Mr. White? So I just want to make sure. So as you said, following the walking tour, now you all go back and right. start compiling mm -hmm. information. Exactly. And, and then we will get an update from you in December. Right. And then following that, the study will actually be complete next yes. summer. Yes. Okay. And for the, uh, the workshop that we're going to hold in December, it's going to be a selective group. So it'll be the council, the mayor, and it's also a development group that was formed based on the study. And also uh, some county representatives, too. That's good to understand. Council Member Rout. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for the information. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. um, with the recommendations of this um, study, mm -hmm. will that be um, sent over to um, the larger plan for the entire county? Or how are those recommendations going to be weighed in relation to the wider plan that is, um, because I know that mm -hmm. um, a, there's a lot of rezoning that's taking place. Right, right. So um, can you explain that process? Well, what the, the study does is identify the best land uses in the area that they see feasible by the market study. What it's also going to do, they're going to look at, because of the proposed new zoning that's going to happen in the area, they're going to make recommendations for that. So it's kind of premature to try to answer that right now until the study's actually complete. But they are going to address that because that was we know that was a concern of the town that they're looking at those proposed zones that one of the zones they definitely don't want to agree with so we're trying to look at that make sure that the uses that they recommend coincide with what the study actually says based on whether it'll change or whether it will stay so the so the recommendations that will be made can play a very influential yes. part yes. in the rezoning for the town of Bladensburg? Um, it will identify. It would identify, I would say that. Um, right now, I do know that the consultant actually interviewed the project manager of the countywide map amendment. Um, I do know that he kind of to address why they wanted to rezone the zone that they actually proposed in that area, and I think it's CS. And I know that the town was looking at CN, which is on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, she's going to make a recommendation with their proposed and I'll look at those uses. And also, just in case it may change, mm -hmm. that if you put CN on the other side, what uses could go there. So that way we're addressing both uses in both Perfect. areas. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. No problem. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rout, for that question. And thank you for the response, Mr. White. And so really, once we get to the point where we've identified a developer for that project or one has been developed, you know, identified, they would be responsible for complying with whatever zoning is in place at that time exactly. in terms of getting those appropriate permits from the right. county and submitting their plans and specs and everything, right? right. Okay. And I think what, what we're trying to do is you're looking at a vision that you see for that particular area. Right now, the vacancy rate is very low. It's a very active area. So now you have to talk to some of the property owners in that area, and if they want to see, okay, what is the future vision? You have a vision for them that they can strive for. Not necessarily saying that they have to do that, but at least you have some guidance of what the town would like to see. So when they come in their proposal, that you now respond to their proposal. Yeah, that makes sense, being able to present what our vision right. and our plan is for the right. community and what we want to see. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. really it reflects what was in the 2009 approved Port Town plan. Mm -hmm. The recommendation there for the town of Bladensburg character area, which they recommend a pedestrian friendly and an active service. Reason why we looked at the uh, Bladensburg waterfront, so we know that's amenity. And we know also know that since the town owns the Boswick House, which is a historic site, that you want to utilize that, those are the amenities you can help guide economic, economic portion. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that you are 
took the, the broader perspective on the project and took the initiative to walk down to the waterfront park and also look at Boswick considering mm -hmm. what we're trying to do with that property. So definitely appreciate that foresight. Are there any questions from staff for Mr. White? Okay, well, we thank you for coming in to give us the update and we'll look forward to the broader meeting coming up in December. December. Okay. Might be good to just lock it in <laughs> before um, mm -hmm. too much time gets here because basically once October hits, it's New Year's, so. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and right down, I should say, uh, as far as the uh, workshop, we don't know whether it's gonna be a virtual workshop or what well, we'll be working with you to see exactly what you wanna do if you wanna hold it here. It is gonna be a selected group and not gonna be open to the general public, especially with COVID. So we have to really look at that. And we wanna make sure that everybody's safe. And even when we were doing the walking tour, we, we wore our masks, practiced social distancing, and we got it done. So we're gonna move this thing forward. It's gonna be a product that I hope you guys enjoy. like. Um, so that's where we are right now. And if you need me to come back to update you on where she is and all like that, we can do that. Great. Thank you again, mm -hmm. Mr. White. We appreciate it. And okay. please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Great. And at this time uh, on the agenda, I'm going to apologize in advance because this is a little long. But uh, as many of you know, last Thursday, we experienced some serious flooding in our community. And we weren't unique. We understand surrounding communities also experienced some major flooding. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to address it because of the storm that took place. In a short span of time, we had a significant amount of rainfall, which led to flash flooding, not only in Bladensburg, but to many areas in the metro region. In addition, storm drains in different parts of the community became backed up with debris, which made it difficult for the rain to get through and go down the drains. In the short span of that storm, our public safety officers received 26 calls for rescue, 26. And we are not a huge police agency. So of course our staff sprang into action from our admin folks who were here to the police department, public works and code enforcement. And I'm thankful that you all were able to help every single person who called for assistance, including opening up the town hall uh, for those who couldn't remain in their home safely. And fortunately, we were able to get through that situation without any staff members or residents being harmed or losing their lives. And so I'm really grateful to that, for that. Even still, we recognize the need to assess the situation and work with the proper agencies to become better prepared for such events. As we all see, extreme weather is not unique anymore and it's happening more regularly. And so this has also given us the opportunity to assess our resources and identify additional equipment needed for faster response. Staff has already began to reach out to WSSC and the county to set up the necessary meetings to address our concerns, and they'll keep us informed along the way. Members of our team will also be on the call tomorrow with the Prince George's County Department of Emergency Management to discuss our concerns with this event, uh, along with other municipalities. And for any of my colleagues on the council, let me know if you didn't get that email. It just came out today, and I'll make sure I forward it to you all because it's important for all of us to be on there. In addition to um, what I stated previously, Senator Malcolm Augustine came out on Friday during our grab and go event. Uh, he was going around the district assessing damage and he offered some advice for our residents and indicated the best course of action for residents who've been impacted by the extreme weather is to file claims with your insurers as soon as possible because there's a threshold of 200 residents needing assistance that has not been met yet, which I find strange considering how bad that storm is. But basically that 200 resident threshold is what's needed before we can qualify for federal assistance. So with this in mind, I wanna encourage all of our residents who experienced damage to their condos, their homes or apartments last Thursday, please file your claims right away. And also if you could email our staff or myself or your uh, council member and please let us know if you have filed a claim that way collectively we can keep a tally because we want to share that with Senator Augustine's office so he can get with the state emergency management uh, department and make sure that we're pushing toward whatever that uh, federal uh, threshold. Also please keep in mind that even while we're trying to do this this is not a fast process trying to get 
federal assistance, especially right now in the midst of a pandemic, it will take time. So in advance, I do ask for your patience. But again, whether your claim is accepted or denied, please let us know so we can track this information and be able to share that with Senator Augustine's office. And actually just before um, this meeting started, there was another message that went out and I wanna share this hotline with you. Um, this is for anyone who needs immediate assistance as a result of the storm in need of housing, food, or financial support. Please call American Red Cross at 703-584-8400. But again, we did wanna just make sure that we shared some information with residents because some folks remarked they hadn't seen a storm in town that bad in 20 years. So we were very fortunate considering. Um, so at this time, we will transition over to our interim town clerk, Miss uh, Town Clerk, <laughs> merging, <laughs> merging words, uh, Mrs. Cecile Cunningham for the 58th Avenue update. Okay, good evening, Mayor Council, residents. I think Vito and I are going to share this update. <laughs> sure. Glad <laughs> so to share. Um, so as you know, the town recently put out an RFP to solicit bids for the 58th um, Avenue project. We did receive five um, companies um, to bid on the project. Um, the lowest coming in at, let me have to be those, 140? It's I'm sorry, one, 113. Mm -hmm. The lowest coming in at 113, um, 332. Um, so right now we are reviewing them um, and we do have a recommendation from our town engineer on um, as they've gone through the respective bids and they provided some recommendation on which contractor to um, reach out to or award the project to. And we did also get some feedback from um, Sue Ellen. So I'll turn it over to Vito. Yeah, as you can see with the bid tabulation here, we had five companies um, respond. And you can see, you know, we have uh, bids that go from the 113,000, the 107, the first set of numbers is a base bid, and the second set is a total bid. There's just some like specifications in there. But the base and total um, tabulations are the same, you know, lowest is lowest on base and total, second is second lowest on base and total, and so forth. Um, so you see the bid range is anywhere from total bid, the uh, right hand column of 113332 up over $200,000. Um, we worked closely with the engineer and also our attorney who uh, has experience with these bids uh, to put this out and um, we received them all Friday. Um, now, there are, we just got these in. Uh, the uh, reliable contracting. Um, I'm going to recommend to approve the contract pending any um, final bid reviews, but it looks like everything's in order. Um, there, there may be some additional funding because it was so wonder if they honor and if it's in the bid, which I think it is, all the line items and quantities, if we can extend this out to other town projects or do uh, the curbing and, and gutters um, for the same amount that we ha we're budgeted through through CDBG, um, we have to talk with them and, and the engineers as well. But that is, you know, the second part of it. But the first part is, you know, I want to bring this to the mayor and council the next meeting to recommend reliable contracting um, be awarded the 58th Avenue bid. Um, yeah, reliable. A very in the county. They're in uh, Millersville or Gambrills. Um, they do a lot of work mm -hmm. in that area. Um, they are a an older company too. I mean, they've been around a while. Um, no, uh, uh but they do do their references. They gave Prince George's County references um, for work done in Laurel. Um, I think New Carrollton. For State Highway, um, there were local Prince George's County references, and the jobs were anywhere between one and a half to two and a half million dollars. 
and this job is um, seventy-five thousand. Is, is how much? One hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, four hundred. Is the is the budget amount of funds we're allowed to receive from CDBG? Great. Any other questions from the council? We went through an extensive process of the line items, the quantities, and everything. Since it's federally funded, you have to go through the Davis Bacon Wage Act, everything. So it was, uh, if it was just us going out to do it, we could just put it out there, you know. But this was a 130 page, I think, or 100 and some page. And the. The uh, document <laughs> and the contractors who did receive the bid are contractors who have already been vetted through the county. Um, if you recall, uh, I think in the June meeting we talked about shortening the um, bidding process because we were behind the pro you know on the project, and so we only sent the RFP out for two weeks, and we sent it to contractors who were already vetted through the um, county, and that was provided through CPJ and Suella. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Line. Yeah, I do recall that conversation just to help ensure that we're right. dealing with, you know, people who've been properly vetted. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that is, oh, sorry, Council Member Rout. Hi, good evening. I wanted to know if um, any of the bids came from a woman or a minority owned business. And if so, what was the offset in, in the cost between the five bids? Thank you. I don't know that they're any women owned, but they, they have to be registered as minority um they need that certification i believe with the county to do any type of work through cdbg grant mm -hmm. so they already have that certification were any of um the ones here do you know manuel louise construction enr american or vmp minority owned enr is enr actually did our spring road project right yeah, they no. did the first they phase did. on 58th avenue too, and spring and road, spring road. So just two of them. We can double check. I'll double check, but I'm. I want to say they're all. They all have that certification, but I'll double check. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Great. At and this and time. And we also see where their office is too. Mm -hmm. uh, for the concern brought up, you know, in county, out of county. Gotcha. I think. We have been fortunate because this was delayed a little bit with the situation with distance learning happening that we do have a little time, but I also recognize we can't drag this out much longer because then we'll be into cold weather and plants starting to shut down for the winter and so forth. So I do appreciate your help. I know it wasn't easy going through these hundred plus <laughs> page documents to drill everything down, but um, just want to open it up one more time for questions. Council Member Lundy or Council Member Blunt. Mm -hmm. All right. At this time, is there a motion to uh, take the acting town administrator's recommendation to approve the bid? We can wait till, uh, let's wait till the- uh, Oh, sorry. That's right. Financial, financial business. business. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Getting good. ahead of myself. <laughs> I will put that aside. <laughs> okay. So next up, um, several members of the Bladensburg Complete Count Census team are um, council members. So just wanted to give an opportunity for the community to hear from them on some of the things that we've been doing uh, to try and help get our numbers up. So at this time, Council Member Lundy, Council Member Rout, or Blunt, any updates you want to share with the community? I know we had the awesome event August 30th here which was our drive up and this lady right here got crazy school donations from all the, pretty much most of the sororities probably in Prince George's County and Montgomery mm -hmm. County uh, but any updates you'd like to share with the community at this time um good evening um town of Bladensburg so I think that the Bladensburg complete census count committee has been working very hard on the town's behalf to try to raise the numbers of the census. Um, a couple of the highlights is the, um, the census complete count team um, has been going out um, almost every Saturday for the last month or so, um, making sure that literature uh, is reaching all of the uh, low counted areas in town which includes hanging flyers or door hangers on their doors, um, letting them know about the information. We had a um, successful event this past weekend 
where we had a ice cream truck social that went, um, it was at the Autumn Woods apartment community where we actually enrolled individuals and their families in the census. We had a couple gift card giveaways. We had school supplies and resources. Um, and so we, we are actually using the, uh, the chief of police terms. We're taking it to the streets. We're actually <laughs> coming to the people um, and definitely trying to remind everyone um, to uh, complete their census. In addition, we uh, the weekend before, we had a, a targeted back to school drive by which uh, we had um, enrolled individuals in the census and also reminded them to register to vote. And once they completed those two items, they could, uh, sign, they could receive um, school supplies for children in pre-K, kindergarten, elementary age, middle school age, high school, and we even had college um, age. Um, so I just want to thank um, some of the partners that have um, donated um, to this event to see um, a successful event, which includes the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity um, in Prince George's County, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, uh, which includes the 8 Iota Sigma and Zeta Tau Sigma chapters, um, the Stephen Cates Camp, um, the Community of Hope Church, um, and that's about, and, and there are other um, residents in town that came and donated lots of supplies. Um, there's like Crystal Williams in town who donated note cards and we, other members in town and, and people that don't live in town, they were very, very gracious with their donations and so we would like to thank them. In addition, the Census Complete um, Count Committee, they, we've been doing infomercials and videos trying to remind members of our community through the use of social media um, to remind everyone to uh, complete their census. And so we don't have that much time. So if the public can assist the complete census count team, that would be very helpful. And the only way you can do that is when you're in the grocery store, maybe standing in line or out in the community pumping gas, you could wave and smile and say, hey, did you complete your census? I mean, that small reminder can go a long way. Um, so at this time, I don't have anything else to say. Great, thank you so much. Council Member Lundy. Well, we also had assistance, um, I mean, the voter International High School of Lonely Park to come out, and we had our youth to come out, so that was very successful. We also registered people to um, to vote who hadn't um, done that yet, so that was a part of also a part of our um, campaign as well. So, like Council Member Route said, we have until what, September 30th is our deadline, so we need you all to <laughs> fill out complete your census questionnaire. It's very important. Thank you, ma'am. Absolutely. Council Member Blunt or Council Member Mendoza, anything else on the census? Okay, so um, just to round it out, we have another event coming up this Saturday at um, Gateway Gardens. And so residents, we need you, if you've done the census, to bring your neighbors and have them completed. Ten minutes is all we need to get them counted. And for ten minutes, when you think they're helping the county get $18,000 and about 1500 of that coming back to the town, if we can get 50 to 100 people there, that would be amazing. Uh, of course, it will take more, but um, we really need you all to be counted because if nothing else, this pandemic has taught us that we need federal assistance. We are a small town, we're a small budget, or we have a small budget. We use our resources wisely, but when you're not counted, it has a direct impact on us. So for example, for the CARES um, Act that was passed by Congress over the summer, Yes, we were grateful we got $575,000 because it went to the county and from there they distributed that to the 27 municipalities in Prince George's County. But that $575 should have been a lot higher based on our population. So if there's four to 5,000 people who are not on that census roll, that's money that we never got. And we get so many requests from residents who are in need of assistance for housing, um, you know, back payments for rent, for food, for diapers, for wipes. There's so many needs that people have, but in order to help you, we need your help to be counted so we can get the resources to provide the necessary services for you. So 
Again, please meet us this Saturday. You'll see posts about it throughout the week in the e-blast and on social media. But 12 to 2 p.m. we'll be out at Gateway Gardens. And so with that, we will wrap up the census update and move into new business. Mrs. Cunningham. All right. Um, so in August, um, the mayor and council toured the Bossip House. Um, that was a wonderful opportunity for them to um, see this great property that, that's, within, that's in the community. Um, as you may know, we have a Boswick uh, committee that's been working um, for a while um, on pretty much soliciting and securing funding um, to build out the property. Um, and so it's, it's, it's ongoing. Um, I know when we had a tour in August and in previous meetings, when we had input from uh, Mayor James, um, the conversation or the discussion was around um, developing a stakeholder group um, that would include residents, youth, um, local businesses, um, invite them to the table so we can get a broader perspective on how we can um, pursue funding and just, I, and just more recommendations, I would imagine, just around how the property can be used. Um, so that is where we are in the process right now. And so um, we would just like to know from the mayor and council um, just what organizations, um, are there any local residents that you would like to be a part of that um, committee? And if there are, just for that information to me so we can actually get that process started. Perfect. And you know I'm going to recommend Ms. Pat McCauley because when she retired, she <laughs> promised that she would still be willing to help. Right. With and Boswick, she, she's, so. she's yes. willing. But we will definitely do that. So do you want us to get your recommendations by the end of the week? Does that work? That would help. Okay. So much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. For the um, stakeholder group. Do you know there's a Friends of Boston group? Is that um, our friends? Why am I? Yeah. But I thought they were uh, with Amon Trust, mm -hmm. not. Well, this is a separate group. Yeah. Some of them are from Sherbury. Mm -hmm. well, they're the friends of Boston. They get Lily involved in Boston. Two months ago, so there's a group of friends of Boston. So this will actually be a separate, a separate committee. Um, because what's, what's happened over the years is that a lot of people who are who, who have been a part of this whole process, they've been a part of it for so long that a lot of the ideas are starting to emerge and they, it's almost like you're not getting any fresh ideas. And so the whole purpose of creating this group is to um, just you know cater to the, the community. We need young people at the table. We need to hear from them. A lot of them have never been to the Boston House um, and so we just want to open it to people who actually can, you know, have a stake in this community. Um, and that was a discussion a few months back. Could they merge? I don't need, I guess we could find out what, what exactly the role is of this other group, because it's odd to have that, but they're not tied to the town in right. any way, and it's a town oh, asset. A town. So no. we can find out what that group is. Um, but if it's anything like some of the other groups that have been around for a while, mm -hmm. they may or may not be willing to. But we can certainly reach out. Right. And if not, we still have to keep moving forward. Right. So um, if you want, I can try to get in touch with Pat, or if you want to, to um, see. I'll get in touch with Pat. OK, to see you know, where they are, what they've been up to. Because in terms of the funding, we're driving that. You know, We complete the applications for the grants. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the maintenance, we're the ones. Our public works department is maintaining right. it. So I'm really not clear on what the role of the other group has been, you know, over the years. So but we, maybe we can find out with so that way if they are and they still is, but because they've been silent, they might still have ideas or can move it on, opposed to just saying no. Mm -hmm. And just hear what they have to say first. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Lundy. Yes. Is there a, a cap on how many people want to be a part of this um, stakeholder group? Um. I honestly would say I would not go over 15, 10, 15. Yeah. Um, because you already have some key people at the table. We already have Sam um, Parker, um, Eamon Trust, um, Neighborhood Design Center. So those are the experts, if you will, at the table. 
um, along with some other folks who kind of make up the committee right now. Um, but we're really looking for residents and folks who, like I said, have a stake in this community and really can provide, help to provide some recommendations and just shape how, you know, the future of Boswick will look. <laughs> so. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, but I think you're right. So if we keep that in mind, 15 is our number. In terms of the technical experts, would you estimate there's what, five-ish of them? Roughly About between five, neighborhood seven. design mm -hmm. center. So really we're looking at seven more people, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We can do that. <laughs> we can come together and do that. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And our next update, he's waiting in the wings, Officer Reinhardt. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, we did invite Morrison uh, Suburban Sand Commission to our meeting tonight. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to attend, but um, I'm ready and willing to give the update for them. Um, as you can look on the TV, uh, there are several locations in town that they're still doing water line replacement. Um, I did meet with WSSC this morning. Um, the only street they have left in town to do is Barnum Street, which is Steep Barnum. Um, that's the one with our large hill and the 5400 block. Um, if you also look where the little red dots are, that's where they have left to do main tie-ins, which will be um, Emmiston Road, Annapolis Road. Um, they do plan on being completed by November of 20 this year. Um, we think back, this construction started back in October of 2018. Um, once this is done, they get the new connections in and Varner Street done, they're going to come back and do a temporary milling of where they actually just put in the water main, and they're going to be back in the spring to do the complete milling and overlay of the project. That'll be from curb to curb. So as you can see on the map, that's going to be probably a good amount of our town that's going to get repaved with new roadways. Um, to include Tilton Road from Emmiston all the way up to the high school. Uh, the next picture of the project, what I'm going to pull up real quick, is the extent of the work. Is basically what they're doing is they're replacing the actual water main and the water line up to the meter. Um, anything past the meter is the homeowner's responsibility. Uh, we haven't had any issues with the project. We have had a couple complaints about parking and traffic and um, when they were starting to do the digging, some residents concerned that they were cracking, some cracking of their walls and stuff like that, but they've portion, WSSC has been contacted and been handling it as, as necessary. We still do have contacts with uh, WSSC. Uh, Mrs. Osanya and Mr. Wilkins are project managers. I have their phone numbers. If the mayor and council would like them at any time, I'd be more willing to email them. Other than that, that's going to be our current update of the extent of work that the WSSC is having right now. Um, Sir? Sunday, I was getting my hair cut at the uh, 54th in Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the pipe busted, mm -hmm. it was hitting the church. So I come over to see seven minutes into just waiting for them because they were like, put me at home. I hung up and I called for these, mm -hmm. you know, this guy to say, look, this is what they want. First thing they ask is, you call the BSSC? I'm like, no. Because the BSSC is not responsive, I guess, on the weekend. Uh, I think what it is is there, and, and I'm not going to make excuses for WSSC or the police department or anything else, but I just know um, we do have contacts for WSSC if something well, does like happen like that. I'm sure they, they wouldn't bother you this morning. Yeah, no, but, but don't hesitate. But I'm call like, me. If, if, you, it if, busted in a, if it's busted and it's like that, don't hesitate to call me um, because I do have the phone and my cell phone to say, hey, we need somebody out to fix it. Most of the stuff over the weekend after hours does go through the WSSC emergency line. And usually they have a crew out within a matter of 10 or 15 minutes because it comes right from the Blaine's Regard or Kenilworth Avenue. Um, I can't explain why the WSS dispatcher was giving you the runaround. I'm not even going to no, 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 pawn it. Put you on hold because. And I'm like, I gotta go. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Mendoza. Council Member Rao? Yeah, so there are um, a couple of concerns that I had. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the first is um, there's been a few lane leaks. Um, in Ward 1, and specifically, there was one bad one where I had to reach out to Chief Collington after hours to get some support. So I would like the number, oh, because residents, you know, as, you 
you know, it's already to grow, uh, they're like reaching out and sometimes I don't know what to say or do. So I'm happy that, um, I think in that situation, I did contact WSSD with that resident. We were unsuccessful as well. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, there are roads in um, the Ward 1 in particular that are affected by the large trucks that are coming mm -hmm. up and down the roads that may not be on the map that you showed. Mm -hmm. So what is the plan for pilling and paving, what's it called? Paving? A milling and paving. Yes. They're, they're yeah, only, no. yeah. They're right. only going to mill and pave where they've actually done the construction work. Now, if we do see where one of their contractors' trucks have issued the roadway, we will definitely contact and reach out to the on-site supervisor and let them know that it is causing damage to our roadways and that needs to be addressed also. Okay, there yeah. are a, a couple sites yeah. that I would like to speak sure. to you about, sure. specifically on Spring and 55th around that loop dealer. Oh. Spring, you're talking about right there behind the save a lot area? Yeah, right mm -hmm. where it comes on 55th and it reaches Spring, there's a really bad like dip because they're doing road, on, they're doing work on Tossig right now mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of bad. It looks mm -hmm. a little bad, yeah. but it's because there are lots of, mm -hmm. it's, now it's traffic. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's not all WSSC yeah. though. There were big school buses mm -hmm. that were, you know, going right there. So it's not, you know, it, it, just WSSC. Yeah. I just think it's because of the wear and tear of mm -hmm. the larger truck. Yeah, and that's something that me and Mr. Hall could probably sit down yeah, with you. Spring and 55th. Spring and 55th. Yeah. It's on Spring Road, it's on 55th. It's, it's right there. We, well, that is actually a feature of the roadway to, to get the water to channel down because there are no storm drains there. So you talk for like concrete and it's caved in, or there's another location that we're. Because Spring and 55th, I'm. At the corner of yeah. Spring and 55th. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. in the middle. Okay. We'll take a look at it and see what we can figure out from that one. Great. Uh, council or staff, any other questions? So I know we started this back in 2018. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's fair to say by late October, early November, they would have wrapped up the last few, you know, to close it out before the cold weather hit? Yes, the project will be completed in November. In November. Um, they just won't be able to get back out because of the winter month to do the full mill and repaving. Now, I mean, they can do like temporary patching on some of the rougher spots, but the full repaving will not have till spring of next year. And then they'll make notifications to the residents via side. And we can also notify them through our message board and our e-blast that cable will happen. Got and it. once that starts to happen, I know everybody's going to be excited because we're going to basically oh, yeah. get brand new roads. Exactly. In about 80% of our roads in town. So. And just as important, those water mains are being repaired, which is critical because um, maybe five or six years ago down here on Edmonston Road, mm -hmm. I think just outside of town, yeah. well, I remember one winter day that family was pulling out of the driveway and the water main wow. cracked and nearly swallowed their car and, and, and we don't want anything like that happening in town with resident safety being jeopardized I think they had a small child in that vehicle it, it could have been really bad so I'm grateful even though it's a temporary inconvenience the long-term prospect is totally worth yeah. it and, and speaking with them they say some of our water mains are 50 60 70 years old at those mm -hmm. places so they're actually digging down and finding old abandoned wooden water mains. So you're talking, they're 100 plus years old. I mean, they're still not in use, but they're finding them as during the process. <laughs> I like that. So Council Member Blunt is all about vintage. So she wants some of that vintage wood from those 100 year old mains. I'm sorry, Council Member Mendoza. 56 places not scheduled under this Tilton Road uh, water main WMR project. Um, there will probably be something in the near future. But again, it's just not involved in the Tilden Road project. Great. Well, thank you. Cool. Appreciate the update. And sorry, WSSC couldn't join us tonight. Uh, so at this time, we'll turn it over to Mr. Tonelli. Uh, Mayor and Council, we got a couple of meetings coming up. Um, I, just, I just want to get a um, uh, just the, who's going to attend. We have the Port Towns quarterly virtual meeting that Colmer Manor is, is holding. Is it Colmer? I'm sorry. Is it um, Cod City? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, and that's on the 23rd, and it's scheduled right now for uh, 6 o'clock. And I'm not sure if everybody got an invitation for that or not. If you have, just want to let you want to respond and let them know. So um, I think that they're still building the agenda. 
Um, also, MML is having a virtual fall conference on October the 8th and 9th. 8th and 9th. And um, has anyone registered yet? Or I have not received feedback from everyone. Okay, so I guess you know, we want to do the registrations all at once. So I've got everybody here you know, who's interested. Um, I put my bid in. What's that? I put my bid in already. Okay. Yep, yep. I did too. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And that's all I have, so I just wanted meeting. to get a, uh, what's that? We have another meeting, um, TTCMA is meeting on, oh, the, yes. on the um, 17th, 7 p.m. virtually, Prince George's County Municipal Association meeting. What is that again? I'm sorry. It's on the 17th of September. 17th. At 7 p.m. is virtual. Okay. The members should have gotten an um, email. You should have gotten it too. You'd have not mm -hmm. let me know. Thank you for the reminder. You're welcome. And that's all. I, that's all we have for the meetings right now. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Tanelli. And at this time, we have come to the end of our work session agenda. We do need about 15 to 20. No, public safety. Public safety. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I just rolled by you, Chief. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I think the mayor got something to do at home. So, um, <laughs> trying to get to the council meeting. So. <laughs> um, but a couple of um, a couple of staff did ask about the June meetings. I'm not sure if you heard me at the beginning, but Council Member Rao did ask that they be tabled the approval of the June work session minutes until October. Okay. So um, that was the reason I only went into the July gotcha. minutes. Okay, over to you, Chief. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, no problem, no problem. Uh, I just want to show that real quick about the uh, thunderstorm we had the other day. Mm -hmm. You mentioned 26 calls for service. That 26 calls for service was just weather-related calls. Mm -hmm. So for that day, we had a total of 70 calls. Mm. So we got that 26 calls for service within an hour and a half of dealing with the storm. And I can't thank our staff enough uh, for the hard work and, and stepping up. You know, it really challenged us as an agency. We called in extra dispatches, and we called in the night shift and a couple of officers in, and every one of them responded and came in. So I, that, that's uh, a testament to the dedication that they have to this organization and to this community, and I can't thank them enough. And again, Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Sean and um, Pernell. You know, Pernell, was, he was off that day, and he just popped right in and sprung right into action, as he always do. So um, I also want to talk about when I first came here, we talked about, you know, making Bladensburg a highly sought-after agency to work for. And in doing so, we need to. We wanted to evolve with our training, with our technology, with our resources, and so I'm excited today to, to present to the, the main council and the community uh, two programs that we have entered into to help our officers be better trained, uh, better prepared, better educated, uh, and to make them more respected in doing their job. We talk about transparency and accountability. Uh, these two software uh, programs that I'm going to discuss tonight uh, will do just that. It has put us on a different platform in terms of increasing our uh, um, pro professionalism, our training, how we respond to calls. Uh, one is the policeone.com. And I'll, I'll be quick with this because there are a number of slides. What is the Police One Academy? It provides a secure, trusted, and reliable online environment for the exchange of information between officers in the department across the United States and around the world. Keeps officers informed and connected with updated training policies, situational awareness, officer safety uh, videos, intuitive learning sessions that certifies them annually and uh, annually according to the Maryland State Police Training Commission's yearly mandated requirements. So every year officers have to, have to go through in-service. And with COVID-19, it's been challenging for police departments across the state to get the in-service I was in. So we uh, 
started looking around to see what can assist us with certifying our officers with update uh, case law, with update training. Uh, so we, we know across the country, we saw a lot of videos of police involved encounters that didn't turn out positive for you know, the community or the people that they had the encounters with. We take these videos when they come in and we don't money more on the quarterback, but we learn best practices. What can we do if we were faced with certain circumstances similar and how were we handling? So who uses Police One? Uh, it's viewed uh, two million visitors per month, over 650,000 registered members sign up for this. Just to qualify and validate this program, uh, it's recognized number one by the Maryland State Police Training Commission when we vetted this. It's also recognized by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. So these practices and policies that, that, that um, people like PERF is the professional uh, executive research form out of Washington, D.C., they've all had a piece in putting this program together, Police One. And it's also a part of um, Lexapol, which is owned by Gordon Graham, uh, who was a longtime police officer turned attorney turned uh, uh, subject expert matter um, person. <clears throat> so you log into our home screen, we had the opportunity to design our, our page. So when anyone log into it, they will see this mission statement that I created. Uh, it says, our mission is to enhance Blazeburg Police personnel's ability to meet the needs of our community by providing 21st century policing that is recognized nationally as well as locally by the Maryland State Police Training Commission, which focuses on best standards, policies, and practices. Additionally, our goal is to continue to strengthen our trust and legitimacy with our residents. And how do we build trust with our community? It's through the services that we provide um, to, the, to the community. So again, training is uh, how we want to enhance our ability to, to incre and improve our services. So this training software goes across the department. Uh, our dispatchers, um, our code enforcement, our public works, their leadership uh, classes on there, as you can see. Uh, this one is um, uh, communication dispatch, as well as you know, COVID-19 information. So when they log in, uh, our training coordinator, who I'll sign uh, PFC Thompson to be the department's training coordinator, he will post these, these uh, classes. So each officer and staff will get an email to let them know that they have uh, in-service training for them. They have a certain suspense date. It goes to the supervisors. They all log in. There's a test associated with you can't cheat the system. If you try to start a video or start a lecture and walk away, it'll time you out and lock you out. So you have to sit in front of it because every now and then it tells you you have to move the mouse or they'll lock you out. So we know that they get and at the end, they have to take a test. So specified training, again, we can put out what we want. Across the board, there's at every level of training for every member of our organization, including chiefs and administrators. So in addition to that, now here's one, this was uh, a class that was assigned to the staff, it says civil rights. So I tell them this is a four hour block and they, uh, they have to log in, they have to go through the videos as well as the lectures, not just videos, there's lectures there as well. They have to take notes because at the end, they're required to take a test. In order for them to pass this course, uh, they have to, the, the, the scale is set, they have to get a minimum of 80 to pass. So once they, they, and I've taken these classes because as a, the leader of the organization, I tell them that I wouldn't ask them to do anything I'm not willing to do. And as busy as I am, I still take the time to, to log in because I need to learn as well and keep training. So I took this cultural awareness test. It was a one hour block and it tells me that I've earned a certificate because I completed the course. So it tells you my score there was, a, was 100 uh, passing the course um, because you have to take notes. One of these courses I took 45 pages of notes. So it, this is nothing to, you know, this is not that easy. But at the end you will benefit from the information you learn. So this is what your certificate look out, uh, looks like. 
So if you see that it says course number and it has a P in front of it. What that P stands for is it's a course that's recognized by the uh, Police Training Commission. It goes towards your in-service hours. So now no longer do we have to go to an outside source to get training that's not relevant to the town of Bladensburg. That's the beauty of this. We can select the courses now that's recognized through the Maryland Police Training Commission and get in service. But when we want to tell out our services to our community, we can go on here and pick. There are 480 uh, something courses in this software that we can pick. And they're constantly updated uh, every day. And that's the civil rights. <clears throat> So when we go in uh, as administrators, if you look up on the top where it says Lexapro Police One Academy, you see the first three tabs the officers see, they can see the dashboard, but the admin tab is for certain members of the department. We can go in, we can reset the, the training, we can add training. I can upload videos that I, I want them to uh, learn. Like I've uploaded the uh, duty to intervene policy is on there. And it's seen by, by police agencies across the country because I got notified by a, a, a police agency in California that asked me about the duty to intervene policy and I sh sent it out there to them. So people are logging in and seeing what we're doing here in Bladensburg. So the second one I want to talk about is um, the daily run sheets and enforcement time sheets. So we also partner with the police that um, it's for municipal police uh, agencies. It's the RMS system for municipalities. So what this is, you see all of these tabs here. Officers can do this right from their MDT in the car, their mobile data terminal in the car. So now we can track uh, their enforcement. We can track their, what they, their productivity, their performance throughout the day. Uh, we can pull up uh, the, the latest laws. If they pull traffic and they need to search what the, the charge the correct charging document will be, there's a tab on here that they can they can click on. It also tracks their time, their mileage, their um, how much fuel they use, um, the start and end time of their shift. So we have two things. We have a lot of time, which is when that's when they receive calls for service, and then unaccounted for time is the time that they just drive around the town. So now we can see exactly what they're doing. This helps out with our evaluations, uh, as well as when we move into our next phase of ComStat, I'll be able to click and pull the data right from here and generate a report. So this is what, what it looks like when you log in. These are other law enforcement partners that are associated with it, and we just brought Bladensburg online with it. So if I want to get an officer's monthly report, I can ask for the date. I can ask, put the officer's ID number in, and it'll tell me what they've done. It automatically populates the data into the report for me. And all I do is point and click and print it out. And I'll be able to report out what an officer does. Again, it helps with the, the uh, to give officers fair evaluations. Like I said, when I came here, there's no more easy rides, no free rides. They have to earn it now and I can see exactly what they're doing. Okay, this is an individual officer. So what we're doing now, we've selected certain officers to use this, and I can see what uh, Officer uh, Harris did uh, for the month of August. He had 32 calls that he handled, and it breaks it down each call that he, he was involved in. Again, so we talk about other resources. We know that LEGIT is the local government insurance trust that insures the town of Bladesburg. We can go here and look up uh, legal uh, arguments, court cases. Um, we can find out ask the question, is a traffic stop so inherently coercive that consent is given by an occupant to search his person will be deemed involuntary? So it will give you the answer in addition to that, it will give you the whole case law. Now we talk about community policing topics. Here are some other resources that officers can log into and learn. Talking about building trust. Talking about community partnerships. Hate crime resources. 
So now our officers now, instead of going off of what they heard or what somebody told them, they can now do research and understand what their job is to make them better out on the street to provide better services to the community. Any questions? I know I kind of blew through that, but I can make this PowerPoint available to you if you want it. Any thank questions? you. Thank you so much, Chief, for that overview. I know you probably, because it's something you love, you could have went another 30 <laughs> minutes. It's like Vito talking about the budget. <laughs> Hey. But I would like to um, open it up to the council and staff for questions or comments. Council Member Mendoza? Nope. Council Member Lundy? Yeah. So, um, so how do, so you can monitor how long they are in the, if they're even in it, using it? Yes, so where they log looking? in every day, they have to. Okay, I mean, I mean the uh, education piece. Yes. So have you set some kind of like goal for what are you going to be Concerned about, say, I'm doing other stuff, but I'm not even trying to get educated about anything. Have you set any parameters around how often they go to those educational training tools? Yes. So what we do is we assign them uh, roll call training. Okay. Every day. Okay. And then they'll take a larger block once a week. Okay. So no matter what, and then the sergeants get notified if they don't do it. Okay. I get a text that said Ty Collinson didn't log into the system. Mm -hmm. So the system, it kind of checks on the officers. Mm -hmm. So I can be doing whatever I'm doing, but I'll get an email to say the officer failed to blow again. Okay. And they'll say they're late on the in-service. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about holding supervisors accountable. Now we have our checks and balances to make sure that everyone's doing what they should be doing. So uh, I, I really like this system. It seems to be very thorough. So I'm, I'm so glad that we're a part of this. I assume that it's already paid for, it's in your budget? Yes. So this system, now we talk about the training budget. Well, this system is $2,900 a year. Okay. So, but it's endless training. When we used to spend eight, nine dollars right. for training. Yeah. So now we can go through this and train mm -hmm. our entire department, including our public works, our code enforcement, our dispatches, everybody benefits from this. Perfect. The commanders. Perfect. And we all get, again, we get certificates. So when I go through officers' folders, their personnel folders, when I got here, there was nothing there mm -hmm. for the officers. So every officer want to have a certificate in their phone. Yes. I know Councilman Mendoza is, uh, he, he can identify with recognizing officers for good work, for hard work, because he likes the, the, the ribbons and things like that. And that's the next goal that we're going to do. And I told him before the end of the year, we will have a ribbon system, we accommodation system, we recognize them. We do bring them in and give them certificates that officers do like to have a ribbon. Yeah, it builds morale. Up on, exactly. You know, so this, again, holds officers accountable. It makes us trainable. It makes us uh, more knowledgeable just doing our job. And we talk about the legitimacy mm -hmm. of the six pillars of the 21st century policing. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about as we evolve and build a better police department. Thank you, perfect. Thank you for those questions, Council Member Lundy. Council yes. Member Blood. Yes. I have a cell phone like that. Something that at work for my job, I have to do the same thing. So that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, yes. That is excellent. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh -huh. Well, you already talked about the cost, but <laughs> that is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback, Council Member Blunt. Council Member Rao? Yes, I do have a question. As you know, on July 13th, um, the mayor and council voted Imagine Hope, um, and there are a number of training opportunities that was noted in that proposal. Um, does this system um, mention anything about mental health first aid yes, or anything yeah. that yes. happened? Yes, it does. But I'm, I'm, we haven't forgotten about imagine. I got oh, asked. No. <laughs> I bring it up. Well, we, well, let me just say, uh, you know, we have been very short, and the people that you're going to see this evening, um, we had a, a total of nine vacancies to fill, um, and we have successfully filled five of them. So we've been doing interviews and backgrounds back to back. Uh, we just did some Thursday. I just picked somebody out the process today. Because as you see here, the history of the people that we are hiring, we're not just filling slots here. We're hiring the best qualified people to represent the Bladensburg Police Department. So when you see the people that come here this evening, this is a testament of who we're building. Now, I will say that our two dispatchers who are highly sought after, the county want them back. Um, but they won't be here this evening because both of them, one had a procedure and one had a prearranged engagement. Um, but I'll give some background when we get to that uh, this evening. 
So is mental health first aid included into um, this system, the policeone.com system? Yes. Yes, okay. it is. Okay. And, and I can give you, provide you. No, I just wanted to know what are the recommended yeah. hours that are um, nationally accredited? So it's built out, we can pick the hours. Okay. So we can, some of them are four hour blocks, some of them are two hour blocks, some of them are one hour blocks. Okay. So we build them out and what the good thing about the system, if they are working on it and then they get a call, they can log out and when they come back, they can pick up right where they are. So the system keeps track of, of the progress. Oh, so it's not the nationally accredited mental health first aid that was recommended? It, it, no, it, it's, it's not. Okay. It's not the nationally accredited. Okay. Um, because I'm not sure which one was nationally accredited that you put in there. I'll put it in there. Yeah. We'll but we'll, yeah, we can talk about it. But okay. this, is, this is recognized by the, at the state level. Okay. And it's recognized by the Ronald Police Training Commission. Okay. So they wouldn't sign their name or uh, IACP. It's the International Associate Chiefs of Police. Mm -hmm. So they all recognize this program. Okay. And then um, on the second, on your daily run sheets, how often are reports themed and analyzed? So let's say you see an uptick in robberies for you know the second week in every month as you're tracking. So with your data pool, when you're doing those data pools and you are doing your CompStat reports, would that then be shared with the training coordinator so that the training coordinator understands, oh wow, we have this theme of domestic violence, so let's train everybody. Is that how the data will be used? Yes, so when we, when we we collect the data, we analyze the data, we come up with a uh, plan of uh, action to, to address the issue. And when we discuss these in our supervisors meeting, so we would, I would tell somebody that, you know, the sergeant, well, on night shift, you guys had an uptick in car break-ins. Sergeant, what are you doing? With, so the sergeant would have to tell me what are they doing. So now with this data, I can look and see between the hours of, of 10 and two, let's say, that's the hot spot. So I need also to saturate that area tonight or, or this, this week. So that's, that's the benefit of using the data to analyze it, to come up with a plan of action to get, you know, to make sure that we, we are covering the area during the time most likely will happen. Well, it sounds like we're, we're, we're leaning more towards making data-driven decisions, which I'm very, very proud of because that is something that um, is, you know, 21st century just government mm -hmm. um, and, you know, reactionary not just based off of themes and what's going on in the community, it's actually using data to drive decisions. So Absolutely. thank you so much. You are. Chief, um, last comment on this, but I want to thank you for being patient with the mayor and council because when we hired you, even after you said you wanted the job, remember we took you to lunch to make sure you <laughs> understood what you were getting into. And the reason I say that is, yes, we have some great officers, but there was also a culture in this department that needed to be blown up, mm -hmm. yep. not rebuilt. It needed to be blown up. Yep. And even as deputy chief, and you know we had challenges where you were trying to move things ahead, but the leadership at the time mm -hmm. would not get with mm -hmm. it. We got through it. You could have very well left and took a different position, but you stayed because we had candid conversations about what was needed. The culture needed to be changed accountability needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. And I, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate it because yes, it took a year and a half, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we're getting there. Pa you know, the pandemic slowed us down, but we're still getting there. And that's why I have 100% confidence in you and your experience because everything you said you were going to do, you did it. And even in a situation where we didn't have the system, mm -hmm. you still were able to deploy the officers mm -hmm. to parts of, towns to deal, to, of the town to deal with specific issues because you had that familiarity with how to use data. We didn't have the, the fancy tool that this is, but because of your prior training, you were able to do that and thus make the community safer. So now I'm excited because we're at that point where you're getting the technology in here. You're getting the officers trained. I don't know if you all understand, when I say this system needed to be blown up to a degree, we had a prior chief who actually refused to train our officers because he believed if you trained them, they would leave. And we, ha we talked about this and how we're blowing that, that mentality up. We will not lose another good officer because we refuse to train them. We will do everything in our power to give our officers every opportunity to be well-educated, well-trained, the top-notch community police. When you say this will be an agency that is sought after, it's already happening. 
There's people who want to come here. There's people who want to come back because they see what you're doing. So again, I want to thank you because I know as a 20 plus year resident of this town, I've seen it. And so much progress has happened over this year and a half and I cannot thank you enough. So thank you for taking the time to invest in this. I know it'll be a learning process as staff get accustomed to utilizing it. I look forward to how it even benefits code and public works. I think, again, you're moving us in the right direction. I had nothing but faith in you, this council, this, your peers. I mean, we know that you love this town and you're giving 200% to this job. And we, for that, we can't thank you enough. Thank you, man. Absolutely. Thank you, man, council and the community and my colleagues for being patient with me while we put all this together. <laughs> Council Member Blood says she has a ribbon for him. And actually, you brought the ribbon idea up. Again, this was another challenge we had previously. We couldn't even get the ribbon program going. But again, it's a new day. By the end of this year, we will have ribbons. <laughs> so thank you so much, Chief. Yes, Council Member Mendoza. I don't even have it at home. Back in 2006, I started the ribbon program. And every chief just. Really? Chief, can you touch on that real quick with the ribbon program? Is well, I tell you, we already have a draft put together. So what the ribbon program is, so officer of the year, uh, supervisor of the year, employee of the year, um, chiefs awards, things like that for doing, like we just recovered uh, a bunch of guns. So those officers should be recognized for going above and beyond, putting themselves in harm's way, just like we, we did for the storm. Those also should be recognized yep. for the hard work. We want them to continue to work. We have to invest in them. Amen. We have to let them know they are appreciated for what they do. So that's what we're going to do with the ribbon program. Absolutely. Thank you again, Chief. And with that, um, if, if there are any other comments or questions, because we do have to move forward with the agenda. At this time, um, I will ask for a motion to go into closed session. We do have a personnel matter we need to discuss. I think it'll be quick, um, so maybe 10 minutes instead of 20, <laughs> as <laughs> indicated here. But is there a motion to move by Council Member Rout? Is there a second? Yes. Seconded. Seconded by Council Member Blunt. All in favor? Let it be known by the saying of aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. So we'll go into closed session for about 10 minutes and then be back at 7 for the Council meeting. Thank you. Woo.